Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear us now. We were having some trouble with sound. Could somebody just um, type a message to let us know if you can hear us? Um, Jason, it looks like there's still no sound. There's a number of people who are, oh, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi. Um, I'm Judy Rabinovitz. I'm a certified educational planner here in Florida. And with us this evening, we have Charles Murphy, um, University of Florida, Pega Ferguson, uh, Florida State University, and Elizabeth Costello, um, UCF. And each of them is actually the director of, of, of admission. We go right to the top. And they are here to answer you know, lots of questions about how college admission was impacted at their respective state universities um, this year based on the pandemic and sort of their projections for the future. So with that, I am going, um, I'm going to um, throw questions at them. And um, if one person answers and it, it seems to be pretty sufficient, we'll just move on to the next question. Um, if you have different perspectives, I'll have you each um, give a response and then, um, if you have questions in the audience, if you if you type them in the chat box, Jason will periodically interrupt um, to ask questions. So let me start with the, I think one of the things that has been really most important, you know, highest on most people's minds because people recognize that the, the pandemic, somebody is still not having sound. I'm just going to keep going because some people say that they can hear us, and hopefully those who can't can play a recording. Um, and we are recording this whole presentation. But anyway, I'd like to find out more from each of the, the universities about COVID's impact on the application process, whether you received more applications, fewer applications, if the reading process was different, and um, perhaps you can elaborate a bit on like how many applications you, you received, and if you also received many applications that you had to disqualify because they did not have scores. Um, let me start ladies first. Um, Haga, let me go, go with you first with FSU. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great that you all are uh, decided to, to spend this evening with us as we're going to share some application updates with you. Um, you know, I have to say, when we started out uh, the application uh, process for this year, uh, we were a little nervous. It's a pandemic, unknown charted territory. We were the only state in the country requiring test scores. So how would that impact our applications? Um, and so there was just a lot of different things that we uh, were concerned about, to be honest with you. One of the first things that we did was to move our application deadline. And so we moved our priority consideration uh, deadline from November 1st to December 1st um, to be able to allow students um, to be able to um, submit their application a little later, uh, as well as submitting test scores. We actually took test scores all through the month of December. And uh, so that was sort of like the first thing that we wanted to, to get done. All in all, um, we had uh, an increase in our applications, which is not what I would have predicted this year, um, with the test score being a requirement and um, everything that's been going on. And so uh, we kind of ended our uh, application cycle now. March 1st was our application deadline. And uh, we received uh, a record number of applications again. We received over 66,000 applications. So we ended up with about 3% of an increase in applications um, compared to, to last year. Um, we did try to extend the opportunity for students uh, to be able to, to take the test scores. So while we had March 1st application, we did um, communicate with students that didn't have uh, February test scores. Uh, we did communicate with them and ask them if they were planning on taking the test in March. And so uh, we were working with some students uh, that were testing in March, knowing that test score was an, an issue for them. Um, but all in all, just very, very pleased with the application process and the number of applications um, that we received from 
just some awesome, awesome students. And I think that was really what struck me this year was just how resilient our students are. And that was evident in, in their applications and how we were reviewing them. And, um, you know, I, all in all, for our profile, for our accepted students GPA, we were a little bit up compared to last year. Uh, test scores, we were a little bit down, which is, you know, a natural consequence of students not being able to retest and maybe just having one test score as opposed to three test scores uh, that they would have in, in the years past. But um, just feel really, really good about the students that we were able to admit to the university. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, how about you for um, UCF? Because you have a completely different admission process with, with rolling admission and that usually goes on longer than UF and FSU. We do. Uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, yes, we are on rolling admission at UCF. So to explain what that is a little bit is, in a nutshell, we start making decisions typically in the beginning of September and we roll decisions out almost on a daily basis. The admissions committee reviews application files as they become complete and they're rolled out. So there's not a specific notification day for a student to get a decision. Um, as they are, as they become a complete file, they, they then uh, move to the committee for review. Um, as always, as was already mentioned, um, we were a little nervous about what it was going to look like um, this year because of the fact that COVID um, was going on and, and obviously all of the things that have gone with that, um, as well as the testing situation and the ability to take tests um, and us having that requirement. So we were we were unsure how it was going to look. Um, we did have a, a, our cycle was just a little bit delayed is pretty much how I, I like to think about it. Everything was a little slower. Um, applications came in slower, um, tests came in slower, and um, our decisions went out, you know, at about the same time, but fewer students um, at, at the beginning, which is typically when we have a lot of our it's September through November of the senior year is when a, a large number of our students are, are offered admission, being on rolling admission. Um, we end it, we don't really end the year um, with yet because May 1st is the day that we stop taking um, fall FTIC or freshman applications. Um, for summer, it's March 1st, so we're no longer accepting summer applications, but we still have another month that we are accepting applications for the fall term for FTICs. Um, right now, we're at about 47,000 applications um, for uh, students coming in for summer and fall. Um, that's about a 3% increase over last year, so we were not anticipating an increase. Um, I think that's, um, as Hagen mentioned, that's not something that we really thought was going to happen, um, but it did. Um, so we we were um, we wanted to make sure that we we had the ability to continue making decisions into the spring term as well. So students that were testing later on in the fall were able to submit those test scores to us. Um, we think our profile, um, the academic credentials for the admitted class, are going to look just about the same as they have previous. Um, the GPAs may be slightly different. Um, the test scores may be slightly slightly lower because students have had a more difficult time testing or testing multiple times. Um, but that's something that during the reading process, we made sure that we, we looked at all of that information that came in because we did understand there were obviously a lot of challenges this year um, for students as well. Um, so that in a nutshell, that's pretty much how, how it's run at, at UCF. We're going to be a, a little bit smaller this year. Our, our freshman class is, is going to be probably more around that 7,500 to 7,700, which is a bit smaller than we were um, a few years ago. So, um, but that's, that's by design at this point. Okay. okay, and Charles with UF. Yeah, um, first thing is, you know, echoing a lot of what was already said. Um, you know, we, we at UF, first of all, with just sort of the application cycle, we adjusted a little bit of our, our deadline. So uh, we made a decision to, to move back our deadline from uh, November 1st to November 16th. So we gave students a couple more weeks. Um, we allowed for test scores testing through the end of the calendar year, so through the end of December, uh, whereas usually you would have had to test by about October of your senior year uh, to meet all of our deadlines. So we tried to allow a little bit more time for the application itself and for the test scores to come in. Um, again, if, if you had asked me and, and probably maybe all of us in, in Florida, you know, in September, what will your application numbers look like? Uh, we probably thought they would be down a little bit, uh, sort of, you know, echoing what's already been said, our actually we're up a little bit um, for us last year we 
uh, received uh, a little less than 50,000 applications, 49,000 and some change. Uh, this year, it looks like uh, we'll be just shy of 53,000 applications. So that's, you know, five, six percent increase somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so, so a modest increase if you're, you know, comparing against some other schools that went test optional and, and saw really massive increases. Um, but we were, we were very happy with that. Um, you know, through the application process, you know, uh, I would say that there was a relatively small group of students and they tended to be um, more out of state students who um, did not complete their application because they did not realize we were not test optional. Um, you know, if you're in California, for example, I, th I think a lot of students just made the assumption that everyone's test optional. So we had a small number of students um, you know, as a percentage of our applicant pool who, who didn't complete. So our incompletion percentage was very slightly up. Um, but for Florida applicants, you know, I think everybody was very well informed about the test policy. So we really didn't see um, any differences in how students completed application from our Florida applicants. Um, our test score profile um, didn't change. It was pretty much exactly the same as last year. So we, we didn't really see any increases or decreases. Um, Anecdotally, I think there were probably, you know, more students who in a, in a quote unquote normal cycle would have tested, you know, multiple times and maybe only tested once or perhaps twice. Um, but we did not, uh, again, we didn't see a, a real difference in, in, in the applicant pool for who we admitted for, for test score profile. Um, and again, I just echo what, what's already been said a little bit, which is, you know, we tried to be as sensitive as possible in our review process to, to all the impacts that, that COVID has had on people. Um, I know in the admissions process uh, with, with the policy that Florida has versus some other schools, a lot of focus is on test score. Um, but, but you see those impacts manifest themselves throughout the application. It's not just test score. Um, we saw it impact students' ability to participate in extracurricular activities. Uh, we saw it, you know, impact in their in their grades or in their curriculum. Um, and we had some students who, you know, were, were unfortunately very negatively impacted in their family situation if a, you know, parent lost a job or um, certainly we had people in our um, in our applicant pool who had uh, close friends or family members who had uh, COVID and and you know had a rough time of it. Um, so, some of whom un unfortunately um, passed away um, due to that. So so that's something that we tried to as much as we could factor in in the admissions process, knowing that COVID impacted everyone. I don't think there's anyone anywhere who says there was no impact whatsoever. But knowing that the impact for different students was different, and some were able to. A flag or better term, write it out a little bit better. Um, you know, had a lot of just as one example. You know, internet connectivity was not an issue for some of our students. For others of our students, the ability to try to complete online coursework when you don't have a device in your house, you don't have an internet connection. Um, those types of things are things that we attempted as best we could to to consider in the application process. So we've we've always tried to consider those. Um, sort of extenuating circumstances, but we, we really tried to um, do that with with a I don't know a, a more more of an eye towards it, for lack of a better term, um, in the admissions process. So that's one thing that was a little bit different. And um, when our, in our application, we used both the common application, and the coalition application. There was a specific question about COVID impacts, and for us, a little over a quarter of the students put something down and, and we read all of those and we considered that in the process. So um, it certainly didn't mean that if a student was impacted, they would be admitted, um, but it's something that we considered as we sort of evaluated them holistically. Uh, again, knowing that those impacts were, were di different for different people. You know, I, I often tell students that when your <clears throat> application is reviewed, it's being reviewed for, two, for data and for voice. In other words, data, your academic record, not just your GPA, but the specific courses you took, how far you took, you know, your math, your science, um, APs, IBs, ACE, dual enrollment, the level of challenge. Um, so much more than just the GPA number, which you will recalculate doing just a core weighted GPA so that a student is not necessarily advantaged or disadvantaged by the way his or her own school um, evaluates um, or, or calculates GPA and the other part of data being test scores but <clears throat> there are so many thousands of students who have the same data that it's your student the student's voice that I, I 
I firmly believe, you know, makes a huge difference. So I, I'd like to find out from each of you things like, um, what do you look for in terms of a personal statement? What makes a great personal statement? Can it actually have a negative impact on admission? Does it really matter in admission? And then let's look at extracurricular the same way. Um, looking at it both in, in, in view of COVID-19 limiting up opportunities, but just in general, what you might look for in terms of extracurricular, because I think that many of our viewers have students who are currently juniors or sophomores, and they need to you know, adequately prepare now for the applications that they will be filing either this summer or the following summer. So um, let's go in reverse order. Um, Charles, if you're too tired of sure. talking, let's start with you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so I mean, I think the, the first thing I'd say, and, and certainly I'll let, let the others uh, speak for their institutions, but I think generally speaking, uh, you know, the most important part of the application is always going to be the academic components. That's going to be the core part of the application. Um, now that being said, at least at UF, you know, academics alone will not make the decision. And, and you're definitely correct that, you know, if you were to look at our our class and our applicant pool numerically, whether you're looking at, you know, GPAs or whether you're looking at test scores, uh, you know, the difference between, um, you know, our, our students who are admitted and maybe the students who, who maybe just, you know, barely did not get admitted for lack of a better term, if you were to look at them statistically, they they look either the same or extremely similar and there's not a lot of difference between them statistically um and so sometimes those decisions you know what may tilt it one way or the other is you know the activities the essays um the things like personal circumstances that i talked about a little bit earlier um that can make the difference so you know in our application process we have a couple short answer questions and then we use sort of the uh, the standard common essay, either from the Common App or the Coalition that we use to review. Um, so it, it is, you know, I think student voice is a good way to put it. Um, we're, we're really looking for the student voice and really looking to learn something about the student that we wouldn't otherwise know um, if, if, if we didn't read the essay. Um, so that could be, uh, you know, expanding on an extracurricular activity you've been involved in. A lot of the essay topics talk about um, you know, how you've thought about something, how you've acted about something, and, and hopefully there's a little bit of introspection there as part of the essay. Um, again, extracurricular activities are, are important to us. Um, we don't have a preconceived notion of what you should be doing, except it should be something. So whether that's work, whether that's sports, whether that's student government, whether that's being active in a religious organization, whatever that is, we want to see students who are, who are active. Um, so, it, you know, one way to think about it, I think, in the extracurricular realm um, is, is we try to get a sense of, you know, um, your dedication and for sort of this is a soft way to describe it. But, you know, if you're participating in activity and then you leave that activity, will you be missed? Right. Have you made an impact that's big enough that, you know, when you when you graduate, and you're no longer on that sports team or, uh, you know, you're you know, you you move to Gainesville. And so you you're no longer working at that place of employment or whatever it might be. Will you be missed? And so we're trying to get a sense of that involvement and impact. And it's not just, the, you know, the length of what you've done, you know, on the on the list of activities or whatnot, but sort of the depth. Um, so we definitely try to try to get a sense of that. And, and again, that can help, you know, move the application, you know, one way or the other in our evaluation when we have, you know, that it, it is sort of contrived. But if, you know, you have two applications and one space left, you know, um, that can make the difference, our sort of evaluation of those, that voice, that those non-academic factors. Okay. Um, Elizabeth? Um, anything different from your perspective? I agree with everything that he, that he said. I mean, I think that it's so important. We are building a class, no matter how small or big our class is, um, any institution that you're applying to, we're building a class and we're building a community on our campuses. And um, if we only have a GPA and a test score to look at, it, it's very easy to make decisions because that's all we have. But we're really trying to get to know a student. So really letting us know 
in the essay. Um, let that reader know a little bit about you. Make your, you know, talk about yourself, and and really, um, that's where you can can make a difference and really put a face and some conversation to a to an application. And that's you know, when we have we all have many applications, um, and those are the ones that really can you know, make us think is, is when we can read that essay and see those list of extracurricular activities. And I think, you know, it's quality, not necessarily quantity. You don't have to be a member of every club and organization at your school or in your community. Um, if, you're, if you're really passionate about something, um, tell us about it. And, and, and being really involved in, in one thing is, is absolutely fine. You don't have to have 42 different clubs and organizations that you're involved in. We know that you can't be active in 42 organizations. So um, that's something that, you know, if you really love writing for your school paper and that's really all you do, that's okay. Um, because that's something that we bring on to our campus. Um, we need folks who are writing for our school papers too. And that's how we know that the community that we build is going to be well-rounded and it's going to be active in many things because that's a great predictor. Um, what you're doing in high school is a great predictor of what you do on our campus and, um, and that's important. What you learn in college isn't going to just be what you learn in the classroom. It's going to be what you learn co-curricularly in your resident halls, all of those things. So um, that's where that's a piece that you can really let the admissions committee know a little bit more about you and not just um, your transcript and your test scores. Um, Heather, are there specific things within an application essay <clears throat> or particular types of extracurriculars <clears throat> that you feel really make a difference and that make a student stand out where you're going to say, yes, this is someone who's going to go in the accepted pile? No. Uh, short okay. answer, no. Um, and I really think it goes to the point of what both um, Charles and Elizabeth are speaking of is that you know, we are, we are looking to build a community, right? Reflective of so our society and, and the state of Florida, because we are, we're a public university. Um, and so, you know, we have, you know, the data set that we're looking at. And, and I do think it's important to, to know that your extracurricular activities is not gonna be able to make up for the deficiencies in the academic curriculum. So, so, so keep that in mind, but where it, what extracurricular and essay really helps us with is really getting a better sense of the person. And it goes back to, what is, do we feel that you're gonna be a good fit for our community? And, you know, as, as we go through life and, and meet different people, there are times where there are people that are not going to fit with us. That doesn't mean that they're a bad person or not going to be successful. It's just we're not a good fit. And so really for us in, the, in reading the essays and looking at the extracurriculars, I'm really looking for a variety. I'm really looking for um, making sure that you know, you don't have a list of 25 clubs that you just have recently joined in 11th and 12th grade because, oh, now you were starting to think that, oh, I need to think about applying to college. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with someone who has been playing guitar since middle school and is doing jujitsu. Now, okay, not everybody next year needs to be applying to jujitsu and guitar. Those are just examples, but, you know, I, it's not a competition, and I don't think you're going to find any admissions office, frankly, that, you know, kind of counts all the clubs and organizations that a student is involved with. It's really more of a, you know, what is it that interests the student? What are they involved with? What do they like to do? And, um, you know, for me, this year, we, because of a whole uncertainty with test scores, um, you know, we didn't know. Somebody could change their mind. They didn't. But since we didn't know, we changed our process so that our readers did not have access to the test scores. So, yes, test scores are a factor, but we appended that on the back end. So when they were reading the application, they did so with just the essay, the academics, and extracurricular. They did not do that with the test scores. And, and that's something that we've decided that we're going to continue on because we did find that students, not students, but employees as they're reading their, the uh, applications, 
there is some implicit bias, right? When you're reading an application for someone who's got a, a 1070 on the SAT versus a 1560. I mean, it just, it just is. So we just remove that part from the application and that's something that we will continue to do. But I just all in all agree with what my colleague says. And, you know, we are the Office of Admissions which means we really like to admit students and, and we do admit fantastic students at all three of our institutions. We just have more application that we have spaces for and that means that we have to make some hard decisions sometimes. Yeah. But by leaving the test score off and, and reading blindly without test score, ultimately was your profile impacted um, in any significant way? By doing it that, was not, it was not. It really has no impact on it, and so that was comforting to us, to be honest with you. Um, and so, but it also allowed us that if there were any outliers, that we were able to do that second and that third read. And I think that was an important component that we perhaps didn't do in previous years. So um, I I liked what we were able to do this year, and, and like I said, you know lessons learned, uh, new experiences, but it's definitely something we will continue to build on and, and I think it's a process that works for us. Yeah, I, I know that requiring test scores isn't a decision that the admission directors had any direct input um, into um, and that it is our, our Florida Board of Governors. Do you know if they are going to be reviewing again for next year um, test optional policies? Anyone? I don't think so. No. I don't, yeah, I, I mean, no, I, yeah. I, I, I don't anticipate it and I would be surprised if they did. Um, but again, that's just speculation. You know, I don't, you know, I don't call them, they don't call me, you know, uh, so I don't have a direct line to them, but uh, I don't anticipate any changes. No. Okay. Does demonstrated interest play a role for any of you? You know, what is demonstrated interest? Right, um, and I think that that's, that's just one of those things that, I don't know, I don't know that I feel entirely comfortable with because they are certainly a segment of the student population that, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't know or, or can, um, you know, gauge in, in what some others are doing. So um, I would say generally speaking, um, you know, in the application review process, we don't really look at that. Um, now, if the student is, is contacting us and, um, you know, they haven't missed a deadline, for instance, I do have the opportunity to, to see if they, you know, open the emails that I sent to them. And then that does play into, into my decision making, yes. Okay. Um, a, a number of questions have come up about bright futures, and I think we all recognize that um, with the bill, um, Senate Bill 86 that was uh, proposed by Senator Dennis um, Baxley of, of Ocala um, seems to be changing every day. In fact, I know that it was on today's you know special order calendar, and you know I don't know that anyone's had a chance yet to review that you know calendar, but I know that it will continue to change and may continue to change until the session is over um, at the end of April, unless that session gets extended. Um, so I'm, and I know lots of our kids are worried that, you know, like parents, especially, you know, is Bright Futures going, you know, to go away? Um, how will this impact cost of attendance? Um, does it impact national merit scholars? Just, you know, wondering if there's any insight perhaps you might share with parents to try to put them a little bit more at ease um, with this potential change? Um, we definitely understand the anxiety. Um, that is not something that we are blind to, so we, we understand. Um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, really any um, input or say in, in the matter. It is in the legislature, and, and as Judy said, it's, it's through it's changing daily. Um, if you follow the bill, it's going to change periodically. Um, new things get added and we, probably through April 30th um, that will happen. So, um, you know, it's one of those stay tuned, I think. Um, it's unfortunately, I know that's probably not the answer that everyone would like us to be able to give, but 
unfortunately right now it's a little uncertain and um, and things could change at any point um, things being added and taken away from the bill and, and honestly I think it's it's we know as much as the general public. We, we do not have an in, in, inside track. Uh, we, we follow this as much as the general public and have as much interest in it. And I think Charles said it you know, earlier really right. They don't call us. So, you know, <laughs> we, we, we really know as much as everybody else. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing that I would add is, you know, all of our universities have government relations offices. So, you know, those are the folks that are engaging with the legislature and, you know, answering questions when the legislature ha has questions about how may this impact you. Um, and again, as was already said, we, we know this is an important piece of the, of the financial puzzle for a, a large number of our families who are considering. So, um, you know, the engagement, it's its not the university is, is uh, you know, completely oblivious to what is happening, but, you know, that's done through our government relations offices. And, you know, we do our best to, to, to advocate for the university, but at the end of the day, you know, these are elected officials. So, you know, if you have a strong opinion on this is the greatest legislation in the world or this is the worst legislation in the world, my suggestion would be to get in contact with your legislature, uh, legislators, um, because, the, you know, that's how the process is set up to work. So, uh, you know, if you have an opinion one way or the other, contact your legislators. Well, I want to go back to demonstrated interest because I know, um, Heather, you gave us a great answer for um, FSU and, you know, a special case where you might look um, to see whether that student had, had shown interest, if that student has, you know, opened emails or not, and maybe there'll be a little extra consideration in that circumstance. Um, but I wonder, um, Charles and Elizabeth, if you could tell us um, in, in what way, if at all, demonstrated interest might play a role in an admission decision. Uh, for UF, the general answer is no. The, the, you know, depending on how you look at it, the one exception perhaps could be those who are applying to visual and performing arts majors. So, you know, if you're, if you're a theater major, if you're a dance major, uh, if you're a music major, um, you audition through those, uh, through those uh, departments. And, you know, if you have a very strong audition and the department is interested in you, um, that can help your, your admissions application. So with that one sort of caveat that, that some may or may not consider demonstrated interest, um, you know, that's really the only thing I can think of that may fall within demonstrated interest that we consider. So you don't, for instance, um, count like phone calls from a student, emails, um, going on a tour. No. Um, clicks on on your website okay and elizabeth no i mean we, we like a lot of other places we we have the information you know and that helps us with our marketing but that doesn't impact the application review at all okay and, and elizabeth anything from ucf we're very similar yeah yeah we're very similar we we do not um demonstrate interest is not a high portion of our mission review um, we don't, I mean, we love to have students visit our campus, but we don't, you know, we don't count that for or against a student because there are students who can't visit um, for whatever reason, whether that be economic, whether that be distance. Um, so that is not something that we're going to, to either give a plus or a minus for a student, although we would love to have you visit when, when we're able to do that again. Um, that's not part of our admission review process. And a number of people are now asking about in-state versus out-of-state. Um, and I wonder if um, perhaps one of you could explain what the rule is for all 12 state universities and then um, how you might look at in-state benefit students. And especially this past year when our in-state students did seem to have, let me say, some of them had more opportunities than certain out-of-state students like the California kids who really had virtually no opportunities for taking tests unless they flew to some other state. Ridiculous. But whoever wants to answer that. <laughs> I, I can start. So um, so the state university system, which is, you know, the 12 campuses, and we represent, you know, three of them in the admissions office. But the 12 campuses, sort of the state rule, uh, is that total enrollment um, of the undergraduate population should be 90%. Um, in state. And so um, I know there's some variation, you know, from campus to campus, but the system is is right around that number, 90% in state. Um, at UF, I think our number is like 91% in state, so slightly higher than that. Our freshman class tends to be um, 
a, a little bit lower in the in-state percentage, but our transfer class is higher in the in-state percentage. Um, so it averages out to about 91% in-state. Um, for the freshman admission process, you know, we look at students the same way. Um, you know, there are definitely differences state to state in the curriculums um, and, you know, acceleration mechanisms. So just to give a quick example, um, we see a lot more students in Florida take ACE classes. We see a lot more students in Florida take dual enrollment classes. So those are just some differences in the structure of the education and, and how students sort of present themselves in the application process. Um, but there's, there's no, you know, separate or, or different criteria uh, for, for students in the UF process. Anything different um, from UCF or FSU? I, I would just say if 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 the op, if you have two applicants and they're on the bubble, you're going to give preference to the in-state student. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we're always all of us are always wanting to make sure that we continue to afford our Floridians, you know, the opportunity to attend. Uh, one of our universities and so um, you know that's kind of our our thinking is that we definitely don't want to disadvantage them in the process yeah and, and one other um, bright futures question came up that I think is important that, that you may know the answer to um, whatever the legislation is do you an, uh, anticipate that it will only impact future students beginning with the kids who are currently juniors um, Elizabeth what do you think what are your thoughts I, I think that's hard to say. I, I don't, you know, we really aren't going to really know that, that that's can be part of the, the legislation can put the, the grandfather folks in or not. And we won't know that until the final bill is voted on. Okay. Um, do you think um, yield, which is the percentage of accepted students who say yes back to you, do you think, um, what has been your yield traditionally? And do you think it will change this year because of COVID? Um, Haggis? Charles, were you ready to say something? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I was going to say, if, if you know what our number will be exactly, we would all love to <laughs> get, it to get that, that from you. It's impossible to predict this year. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I, I mean, the truth is, I think all of us are are really just very concerned in the sense that yield is probably the most unpredictable this year compared to any other year, right? I mean, you have a pandemic and, you know, how that has impacted um, students and their family members, frankly, in some ways is, is a little bit unknown. So, um, you know, as we look towards, you know, what we will be yielding, what we are seeing already is, you know, we have more students wanting to start in the fall and accepting our fall offer versus the summer. They don't want to start in the summer. Well, and, and some of that is because these students are signaling, I'm done taking classes online. And I think most of us will still have classes online in the summertime. So therefore, I want to start in, in the fall. And so, you know, to me, it's, you know, it's, and I think Elizabeth was said this earlier, is this was sort of a cycle where everything was just happening a little bit later. And so I think as we're going into like three weeks before our May 1st deadline, we're all sort of like, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you. So Judy, I, I would welcome somebody. I mean, I, I have my projections, projections and I follow those very closely, but you know, um, is that where we're going to end up? I, I don't know. Too early to now, tell. I'll be the first to admit last year, I really thought that our numbers would be down um, when we had the enrolling class and, and we were concerned by that and we wound up over enrolling. Um, and we didn't, you know, who would have thought in the middle of COVID that we would have more students than we had anticipated. And, and that's, that's a, a good and a bad problem. Um, so that's something that we, predicting yield, if, if we had the magic button for that, we would, we would all be, um, you know, ruling the world, I think. But unfortunately, we don't. And COVID has just added another fun spin to it. So it's hard to, hard to say what the yield will be on yes. any given year. Yeah. 
What did it take to get into each of your honors programs this year? I, I can start. I don't know. We're all looking at each other here. Yeah. So um, for for the UF honors program, just to give you know thirty seconds on the process. We're not letting him um, go first next time. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm just, I don't. Maybe I, I feel like I'm waiting. Okay. Maybe I'm, sorry. I'll be quiet for the next one. Um, yeah. But the um, for the UF honors program. Um, you have to opt in in the application process. So uh, there are two additional essays that you have to submit along with the application if you want to be considered for the honors program. So that's number one. So if you don't do that, you will not be considered for the honors program regardless. Um, so once you opt in, uh, you go through the normal application review process. In our process, we don't even know if you've applied to the honors program or not. We just we, we make the decision going through the regular process. Uh, if you're identified for admission, um, then what happens is that you know we've done our evaluation of your application uh, and then the honors program does an evaluation of those additional essays that you submitted that are specific to the honors program so we take the evaluation that the honors program has done on your essays and we take the admissions evaluation of what we've done in the admissions office and we sort of put those two things together and, and make a decision um, for who's offered honors spot so there's no minimums or cutoff scores or anything like that but you, as you can probably assume, these represent students who are at the higher end of our profile in terms of test scores, GPA, and then the things that aren't quantitative as much like, you know, have our highest ratings in their extracurricular involvement, have the highest ratings from the honors program for their essays. Um, so there isn't, you know, if I have X GPA and Y test score, I will be in the honors program because we're really looking at multiple factors. Um, so I don't have a, a minimum or, a, or anything like that to give you. Um, and I just don't have it off the top of my head, um, but there are statistics on the honors website for the GPA and the, and the test score. And what I can tell you is that they represent the top end of our applicant pool and they're very high. Um, but again, there's, there's no, you cannot be admitted if you don't have, you know, X or Y GPA. Okay. At UCF, Anything because we're on, that we're at rolling admissions, so we start making decisions for the admission process to the university in September. Usually about October, the Burnett Honors College will open up their application. Um, students do need to be admitted to the university prior to submitting their uh, Honors College application. Uh, it is a separate, completely separate, it's read by a separate committee. Um, it is a, a, a smaller program um, that obviously there's about 1,700 students in our Burnett Honors College. So typically the students profile, they're typically um, in about the 10, top 10% 10 of our incoming class. So if you can kind of look at our averages, that's typically where they're going to fall. Um, it is a competitive process. There's essay writing to do for that, and they need to submit that as soon as possible um, once they've been offered admission if they're interested. Um, there is a deadline for in the beginning of January, um, and that is for students looking for scholarship funding from the Honors College, and then they have a, a further deadline in March, but students applying later in the year may still get into Honors, but they will not have scholarship funding um, through the Honors College. They may have it through undergraduate admissions, but the scholarship funds are given at, to the Honors College students through the Honors College um, for those that have met that mid-January deadline. And, and for FSU, our process is um, similar to University of, of Florida in terms of um, being able to apply to the honors program through our application. And uh, the honors program reviews the, the student's record based on their responses, et cetera. And then we kind of, before we are releasing decisions, kind of look at those records all together and what the recommendations are. Um, we also uh, release our scholarships at the same time. So students um, receive scholarship notification, honors program notification, and uh, admission into the university, and it's all handled at that one time. And a number of questions have come in in terms of whether the vaccine will be a requirement. And I know before you, before you joined us early, um, Charles, um, Pega and um, uh, Elizabeth and I, um, Jason, discussed the vaccine, and it looks like it is not going to be a requirement for students or faculty next year. Any comments or? Okay. <laughs> Very I'm trying to be answer. quiet because you keep telling me I'm answering first. And so there's just silence. <laughs> no, 
I don't think we will be, but I, I will sort of, you know, maybe toot UF's horn a little bit. Now that vaccines in Florida have opened up to everybody, we did a mass vaccination of over 5,000 people on Monday. That included a lot of students, faculty, and staff. I'll be getting my first shot on Friday. So, um, you know, we're encouraging it, uh, but uh, I don't think that it's in the plans to require it. Yeah, I, I agree with Charles. And I think at all three of our institutions, uh, we have vaccination sites. And so I was able to get my vaccine at Florida State, you know, a month ago. And they opened up this week to uh, teenagers, 16 years and older in the community as well. And so um, I, I have not heard any any talk about making it a requirement, um, and but I do think it will definitely be something that is strongly recommended. And um, I'm wondering what each of you envisions, you know, campus to look like um, this summer because of summer B enrollment and, you know, in the fall. Um, let, let me start with, um, with Hega. Um, what I, we're hoping that campus is going to look like in the summer is getting sort of gradually back to that level of activity that we all have missed terribly and um you know kind of getting us ready for the for the fall semester um i know that there's been some questions in terms of what the, the uh, class is going to be like and we're hoping to be close to 50 percent um face to face uh with practice for the summer um and i've told my summer students you know it's great you have an opportunity to if you wanted to stay home and take classes at florida state during the summertime you'll be able to do that or if you decide you want to come in the, in the summer to the Tallahassee campus, you'll be able to do that as, as well. But I think that the, the community, the university community and the surrounding community are really all on board on, on moving forward and, and getting back to whatever the normal is uh, and making those preparations for that. What about your students who are accepted in one of your pathway programs that will be that to start out of the country? Um, do you envision that that may happen this year and especially say um, on your Valencia campus? Well, um, we actually have students abroad right now. They left in um, January to our study abroad centers. And so we have students on the London campus, Valencia, as well as Florence. That's and great. so um, they're all doing awesome. They are, of course, adhering to um, the health guidelines at the country as well as the CDCs. And so we are, as we're preparing for this next year, uh, we are opening up all our study centers again. Um, you know, provided, of course, that, you know, we're clear to be able to send students. But yes, we fully expect to be fully operational. Yeah. And Elizabeth, what do you expect things to look like summer and fall? Yeah, very similar to FSU. Um, we are going to be slowly opening up the, the numbers, so hopefully about 50%. We're trying to do as many courses in, in person as we can. Um, you know, we have a lot of students that are really excited about being back on campus and and wanting to do that. Um, fall will be even more. Um, fall, we hope, will be completely back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, so we're excited about that as well. Um, you know, and, and you know, people are, are looking at both sides of it. Some would, are rather staying online, rather some want to be on campus. So fortunately, we've always had online classes, so students can, can still do that if they really would like to do that, um, that that's an option for them. But we anticipate, at least right now, that fall will look um, look like it was pre-COVID, hopefully. Um, I'm sure yep. we'll still be wearing masks, and that's probably, you know, going to be for the foreseeable future, but um, mm -hmm. population-wise, we're hoping to be back to to more normal. Right, and, and Charles at, at UF? Yeah, uh, pretty similar, and, and I would just, you know, echo what Elizabeth already said, is, is that even pre-COVID, um, you know, there were online classes, and it's not uncommon for a student to have in-person and, you know, an online class or two. Um, so uh, this, so the first summer session, which is summer A, freshmen pretty much do not start that summer session, but it'll be very hybrid, socially distanced, et cetera. The plan right now, and, and of course with COVID, everything is you know subject to change if, if circumstances change, but the plan for summer B, which for us starts at the end of June, is for it to look like summer B did in 2019. 
which would be sort of typical class capacities. Uh, I believe the phrase that um, has been used by campus leadership is that anyone who wants to take an in-person class will be able to take an in-person class, but we will still have the online options that we've had previously. Um, and, and then fall will look sort of at least curriculum quote unquote normal with class capacities. Again, there are always some online options. Yeah, it's definitely some details to work out, masks, et cetera. Um, what the you know testing policy will be right now? Students who are on campus classes have to test on a regular basis. Um, for the students who have on campus classes right now, um, but moving towards you know more fully uh, in person. Uh, again, remembering that it's never one hundred percent of classes are in person. There's always some online options. Um, I, I I I guess um. A, a big question now is how that application process is going to look next year. And I'm assuming that next year and perhaps the year after that, there will be a level of sensitivity um, to the pandemic, even though let's hope it will be in the past tense, because we know that students who are even freshmen now have had more limited opportunities to take advantage of, of, of extracurricular activities, summer activities. but. Um, you know, sort of looking forward, do you envision any changes at all to the application itself or to the application process? <coughs> For Florida State, no, I, I don't think so. I kind of had touched on earlier that we were reading without test scores uh, as part of what our counselors do, and, and that's something that we're going to continue to do. Um, that was a change this year. But otherwise, we have no plans to change our application. It's capturing the information that we want and need and use in our application review process. And so, um, you know, I'd like to go into this new year with as, as few changes as possible. Mm -hmm. Is that true generally for the other two of you? It is for us. Okay. Yeah, I don't anticipate any major changes. Okay. And to the best of, of my knowledge, students will be able to apply after August 1st, which is when, if they're using Common App, because that is when the new Common App, uh, when data from this year's Common App can roll over or students can open up a new Common App. Um, coalition, I think, um, I don't know, can students, two of you are on Coalition, um, can a student submit a Coalition application, you know, even in July for next year? And similarly, um, Elizabeth, whether a student can use UCF's um, application um, and submit it as early as, as July, because there are definitely some eager beavers in our audience who want to be sure that their students get their applications submitted, you know, early or well, well ahead of deadline. Well, I can start off with UCF. We would prefer you not to to um, spend that summer obsessing over over that. Um, we will open up our application, our online application, that's our institutional application, probably mid to the end of August. Um, we will not start reviewing applications until um, beginning of September. So students aren't necessarily advantaged by getting that in early, but they really won't even have the opportunity. We're on Common App as well. That will open up April, um, sorry, August 1st, and then probably mid to the end of August for our institutional. Mm -hmm. Because like, that's probably pretty general for for you know for all of you, I would assume. Um, I have one last question, and then I'm going to see. Um, Jason has also been taking note of some of the other audience questions that are coming in. But um, what's the appeal process like for a student who has been um, either turned down or um, waitlisted at your either any of your universities? And how likely is that an appeal to be successful? What does a student have to do to have a successful appeal? <laughs> um, for the appeals process, uh, gosh, I, I would have to say, you know, I think the whole premise for submitting an appeal, it's important to know that, you know, we do a really thorough review of the application uh, when we are giving decisions. So in order for us to be able to hear an appeal, that the student will need to present new information that was not available at the time that, that we were reviewing the application. And so, um, you know, I think sometimes, 
you know, obviously there's a lot of emotions attached to it and we understand that, but really in order for us to, to be a true appeal, um, they need to have new information. We do have an a, a appeals website that we actually list what all the different criteria are um, that uh, we would want students to um, submit to us as well as deadlines. Um, so that if you are appealing, then you know this is the deadline for submitting everything and this is what you would need to submit and this is when you will get a decision. So it's a really very structured uh, type of process. For our priority decisions, we typically release our decisions in February. So February 18th was this year. And so if somebody wanted to appeal on February the 19th, um, they can do that, but we will not be hearing an appeal from them until mid-April. And uh, looking at the total number of appeals, um, in terms of the appeals to be successful for us, it's less than 2%. So we always kind of counsel uh, them to make sure that they are also pursuing other options because again we, we did a really thorough review um, you know the, the initial applications when when we had it then mm -hmm. process so, any different for either of, of you um, Charles or Elizabeth not really very similar if you Google you know uf admissions appeals you can find the website and there's very specific reasons why you can appeal and, and also you know what is not a valid reason to appeal like you know which which we understand but you know i really want to go to uf or fsu or ucf you know it is not going to be a compelling reason that would change the decision um but again for us you can find the info on, on the web if you're interested and it's the same at ucf as well okay um jason would you like to Come, I'm going to give Jason my seat. <laughs> Just going to hop over here because I think my computer's acting up. Uh, I could literally keep you guys here all night uh, asking questions because there were so many that came through, and I'm, I'm not going to do that because uh, I really appreciate the time that you gave us. So I'm just going to ask you one question. Um, over over the past year and a half at this point, it you know everyone across the country kind of treated COVID differently. Um, and that went state by state and person by person. So, you know, as we all know, in Florida, we are very, very open. In Texas, there's no masks. In California, you could, it's still a struggle to eat in restaurants. So can you just give us a little bit information of how do you compare a student uh, based upon the states they're coming from and their personal decisions to either self-isolate or go out and participate in lots of uh, extracurricular activities or activities in general. I can start off a little bit. I think we've all been mindful of everything that everybody has gone through over the past year. And, and we understand that you know, some people have had more opportunities than others to participate in things. And obviously health and safety has been the ultimate important thing for everyone um, as we moved through these completely uncharted waters. Um, so I, I think that the, the thing with, with COVID and the thing with that has been going on is the person reading your, your application has been going through it as well. There's nobody that has not been touched by what's gone on the past year. Um, so you're not having to explain that to us in, in great detail because we all know that everyone has struggled in, in some way, whether that be big or small. I, I agree with what Elizabeth um, just said. I, I, you know, I think sometimes people forget that, you know, the, the lens through which we are reviewing a uh, student's application is is really trying to find ways to to get the students admitted and you know I, I don't think any of us would even think about you know having sort of a, a look at students application and see that they were not taking sufficient enough of, of extracurricular activities that that was being held against them i think even with classes to be honest with you i think um you know we had many students that said you know, my online classes was really just difficult. I just didn't find that that was a good, um, you know, fit for me and, and therefore maybe not has done as well. And I think we could all relate to that at different levels. So, 
um, I, I feel like we really were very uh, conscious in making sure that we were reviewing students in that in that lens, if you will, of knowing how it was negatively impacting the student extracurricular, but also academically and personally, medically, et cetera. Yeah, and again, just to echo what's already been said, I, you know, I think in our process, we try to do the best to, to get a sense of the students' um, personal circumstances and the community that they're a part of when we're evaluating those things. And I think COVID, you know, and the pandemic has added another layer to that process that already existed. Um, because, you know, none of us here, and I think, you know, I speak for probably most colleges and universities, um, you know, always looked at that context, knowing that the availability of, you know, the opportunity to participate in certain activities, the opportunity to take certain classes, et cetera, is influenced by your community, by your high school, et cetera. And so context has always been part of, of our um, application process and COVID is just adding another layer of that uh, because, you know, as Elizabeth said, everyone's been impacted in some way, but as, as, as Jason just said, some are impacted in different ways because they're immunocompromised and they, they for their safety, really are staying in the home, for example. So we try to take that context in when we're reviewing, um, regardless of what that context is, and certainly COVID fits uh, under that umbrella. Great. Uh, just one last question real quickly. Uh, when can uh, when can students visit for on-campus tours? I'm so glad you asked that because that's probably one of the most frequently asked questions we get uh, nowadays, to be honest. Um, right now at Florida State, we are wanting to accommodate our accepted students. So uh, we are doing that through uh, the month of, of May. And then we are opening it up for prospective students in June. Very similar at UF. We're currently having programs uh, right now for our admitted students. And I'll be the first to tell you we don't have nearly as much space as we need. Um, you know, because we're doing social distancing, small tours, et cetera. Um, but we hope to open it up in the same time period, likely late May, early June for any student to sign up for. But I would say for, for us and everybody else, just realize that the capacity that places are gonna have is going to be relatively low and the demand to visit is going to be extremely high. So you may need a little bit of a little bit of patience to, to be able to sign up for a tour because all of our campuses are navigating the same safety aspects of, of getting people uh, around campus in, in a safe manner and into buildings, et cetera. So um, we hope to start that up soon, but just know it's probably just like everything else going to take us a little while to ramp up to, you know, really be able to accommodate all the people that want to visit. At UCF, we are available for in-person appointments. If you want to meet with a counselor we, by appointment only, we definitely can do that. We also are offering self-guided tours right now for students. Um, we will be, um, we're working on a plan to make sure that we're open for regular tours soon um, at a smaller capacity, obviously. Um, but that will be coming later this summer into the early fall, most likely. Great. Well, I really would like to thank you all again for your time. We really appreciate you you coming on with us tonight and talking to my mother and myself. And uh, we, we, I think we had about 400 people online with us. So uh, that was really exciting on our part. Um, and I uh, wish you all the best and stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, for everyone online, we did record this. The recording is going to be available on YouTube probably in the next hour. And uh, if you have any additional questions that I can help with, just send them my way and I'll see if I can get you those answers. So thanks a lot and have a good night. Thanks everyone. Stay, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, thank you, Hega, Char Charles, Elizabeth. Um, always great to um, interact with you and, 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 and see you and see your smiling faces. So thank you for everything, for being so gracious with your time. Thank you for having us. Bye everyone.